My name's Ken. I'm the garden center owner. So we are, this is number 58, 58 years in business. Uh, my father-in-law started the business back in 1962 uh, as a landscape company. We just had a station wagon, a wheelbarrow. And the, the, the rumor is, I don't know if this is real, but he can tell a story better than I can even. Uh, he, he borrowed a wheelbarrow. It's a tool. He started making the, started the business anyway. Uh, the next year we started a garden center, first one in Prescott. Really the first one in northern Arizona, Waters was the first. Back in the 60s, this was a really small town. But he'd been selling fencing down in Phoenix for many, many years. And it got hot, the economy tanked. He said, I've been wanting to go to Prescott anyway, we're going. It just started coming up back in the late 50s. So that's kind of the family history. Lisa was born and raised in the, in the business, so that's my wife. And so I married a Waters. That's how Ken Lane comes to own Waters Garden Center. It's Ken and Lisa Waters Lane owns the garden center, actually. So today you'll find Lisa working here, I'm working here. Our daughter's working here, Mackenzie. You see a real pretty tall blonde down there. That's Mackenzie. Uh, so we got all the kids have been raised in the business. They got very strong work ethics because you didn't make gas money. You didn't get you didn't get what you wanted unless you worked for it. This is kind of how we train them. So they, they do real well. We're real proud of them. Um, anyway, today's class is kind of a catch-all. It's what looks good, what plants well, what, what fall plants can you put in the ground, and then some other key tips that I think I'm doing in my gardens that I think will help you in yours. That's kind of a capture of all of it. We'll do all that in about 50 minutes or so. I'll leave time for questions and that kind of stuff. Seem, seem okay? So that's kind of the program. Um, in my own gardens, what I'm doing right now, just kind of the fall, so autumn starts next week, and you're starting to see some fall color. Up in Flagstaff, they're in fall, so you're seeing all the sumacs in full color. So hillsides are just beautiful orange and reds. Here, we're about a week or two behind them, so probably by the end of this month, it'll be full fall. So the maples will be in color, the sumacs will be going, that first leading edge. And it's, a, it's what we're famous for. People come out of, the, out of Phoenix just to come up and see our groves of aspens and, and maples and envy. They wish they could have those down there. They can't. They don't grow. They only grow up here. So, but you need to prep your, your, your gardens to get ready. We'll start to see our first frost about Halloween. Actually, the 100-year average is October 29 for Prescott Arizona. I think it's November 1 or something for Prescott Battle. Paul is probably a little bit sooner than that, so that's probably more like the 20th of October. But somewhere in the, the end of October, it will get chilly. Now, it'll, at night, it'll get frosty, but it'll be really nice. It'll pop right back up during the day. And so that's kind of how we operate. We have, we have uh, a lot of Indian summers, if they call it. I don't know why they call it that. It seems offensive, but the old schools, Indian summers, that's where it was getting cold, and then all of a sudden it comes right back and goes, oh, no, it's nice again. We'll do that right to the end of the year. And then January, it's just cold. It's just cold. There's nothing to do with it. I mean, it's just cold. That's when your evergreens really stand out and kind of carry you through in the landscape as far as that goes. What I'm doing to prep for that whole sequence for the fall is um, I'm summer pruning back certain things. So my oak trees, especially the wild oaks, they've grown about this much. I've already pruned it back twice. I don't want them to get big and take out my view. One's in front of the pond, looks perfect. The blue color of the oak with that mysterious deep pool of, of, of pond water. It just looks really good, but if it grows too big, it obliterates the, the view. You hear it, but you can't see it. And so I need, I'm starting to take that back now, actually so that I can keep it in check. I cut back my thyme lawn last week. The reason I did that, now thyme, you don't really prune. You don't cut, you don't mow. It's an evergreen lawn, it's creeping thyme, herbal. So animals don't eat it, it's low care, low water, and I'm not gonna be resting the kids, so I don't need a bluegrass fescue lawn anymore. I just want it to look good, soften up the patios. So it's maybe three, 400 square feet, very small. I cut it back and I fertilized it so that I can get it back to look. Time can be a little uneven, so I'm starting to cut it back so it looks more, more manicured, because I want it to look like a lawn. And then I fertilize it to push new growth. 
So now I've got new growth before the winter, before the cold comes. Because once it, once we start to get too cold, things stop growing. They may be evergreen, but they stop growing. So I'm trying to flush things out now so they look at their prime just as they stop growing. So I'm, I'm trying to work a season ahead so my gardens look good. And that's just what gardeners do. Gardeners are always thinking of ahead. Uh, my peach tree has a, a, a tremendous harvest of peaches. It's a really good fruit here. Uh, I've picked the peaches. This is a container garden peach. It's got a trunk on it like this. It's in a pot about this big. It's been in there for many, many years. That looks great, but it's on the patio. And I want the peach to get too big. So I'm, so, I'm, I'm summer pruning these suckers, the, the summer growth. So I trim it back. The secret to keeping plants in check or to size is this late summer pruning. And so that's what keeps it down. I'll do heavy pruning, thin it out, make it more open, uh, more technical pruning in midwinter. So usually after the new year, I'll start taking a nice day. I'm getting bored at this point. I put on about 10 pounds, all the Christmas cookies. I just need to get outdoors with some fresh air. I'll go out and start pruning. Uh, that's when I'll get more technical. Now I just want to bring back the plants so they stay the size that I want them to do. And I think that's okay. Uh, the technical, the, the book says you can print up to 10% of the foliage, foliage mass whenever you want. Doesn't matter. 10%. Uh, if you prune more than that, you're taking more foliage out so that it doesn't quite have enough leaves to create photosynthesis to make things happen. But those are some things I'm getting and starting to plan to keep things, keep them looking good right now. Okay? The number one thing you can do right now for your fall gardens, the most important, if you don't do anything else, what you should do, I don't care what the age of your landscape is, is fertilize. And you start to see the first fall color. You're starting to see it now, but by the end of October, you should fertilize everything in the landscape. And here's the reason why. So there is no nutrients in your garden, in your soils, there's no food. The plants are totally dependent on you. This is a hard concept for you Midwestern folks to wrap, or wrap your brain around because uh, you've got eight foot of topsoil, which is like unlimited uh, nutrients and moisture. Here we've got eight millimeters. I doubt if you got that. Some of you have none. You've got just crap soil. Here you've got to actually amend and nurture your plants more often. Or what will happen is your fall color, it won't be red, it'll be yellow orange or something muted. You can tell they're anemic. There's something going on with the plants. And your gardener gut will tell you it doesn't quite seem right. It's almost always going to be a nutrient or pH thing. So you're trying to fertilize now and your plants are going to use the food right now. That's the food it's going to use through the winter to set next spring's flower and leaf buds. So if they're left hungry, what will happen is next spring will be even more and get more pronounced. The leaves will be quite small. Your lilacs, they won't bloom. You won't have the fruit that you have this year. You need to replenish that. I would say that the most important feeding of the year is in the fall. So it's, it's now through, through October. You just everything in the yard. So I'm starting to do all of that. I've done my time lawn, it's all done. I want to flush the growth. I'm starting to do my other stuff, my roses and lilacs and fruit trees and that kind of stuff, okay? So what I'm fertilizing with is my number one thing. This is called all-purpose plant food. This is uh, cottonseed. I want to introduce to my lovely assistant. Uh, you would call her Marty. I just call her mom. And so she's up busy and go, hey, my assistant's out. Why don't you run the camera for me? She goes, I'd love to do that. So you're, <laughs> say hi, mom. Hello. <laughs> so anyway, um, this is uh, a cottonseed meal and bird guano. It's pretty much in some sulfur. So it brings the pH down and helps the plant take in the nutrients. The great thing about organic foods, which is way better than synthetic foods. So I'd say probably stay away from the Arth Arthos, Scott's, miracle Grow kind of stuff. Sometimes that can do more damage than good, uh, especially when you don't have a lot of nutrients in your soil already. Uh, organics break down much slower and they're feeding not just the plant, they're feeding the soil. So the plants want to root and grow better. So, and they're releasing over a very long period of time. So you put this application down, it will feed for a month, two months. 
three months, sometimes four, so it just depends on the moisture we get, but at least three months it'll fertilize your plants to get better uptake. So none of it's wasted, it all stays, the plant's absorbing it. I did make this one for, if you do a lot of, stay there. So, after the last downturn, remember that? That's like old school anymore. That was 08, 9, 10. The 11 was kind of the bottom, then it would sort of rebound back up. Uh, fruits, vegetables, victory gardens were big. I mean, it just came back big. Everyone wanted to eat out of their backyard. So, okay, well, again, again, fruit trees, we introduced fruit trees, vegetables went off the charts and they stayed there. And so my, the, my edible birds wanted 100% pure organic. So I made this one specifically for fruits and vegetables, our fruits and vegetables. So many times we have a lack of calcium. That's why your tomatoes, when you blossom in rut, that black spot on the end, your peppers, your, your, your squash won't form, your apples will be smaller. That's usually a, a calcium deficiency. So this, I put 7% calcium in it. In fact, it's the highest ingredient, it's calcium. Just because I know we're dealing with plants that need that. And so I made this recipe for us here. And it's completely organic. The other one, we call it all natural. But the second you put a mineral in it, you can't technically call it truly organic. The purist would not say that. Uh, so as soon as you put iron or sulfur, that kind of stuff, it's not technically considered organic. This is a completely organic. All natural, but not organic. Okay. Yes? You said fruits. Is that, is that for fruit trees? This is for fruit trees, vegetables, uh, anything blooming, really. Your lilacs. Uh, anything that blooms in the spring would be good for it. But I made it specifically for fruits and vegetables. And what's the name of that? Fruit and vegetable food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not very original. The other one's called all-purpose plant food. To lawn food, to perennials, to flowers. It's just a good all catch, catch all kind of kind of fertilizer. This one I'm recommending for folks. Now this is not a food. A organic orange. This is humic acid. Humic acid is if you take a, a uh, if you take a compost pile, you just compost it down to its lowest element. The last remaining element is humic acid. It's like magic gold. It's like gold for uh, uh, for plants. I tell folks where they've got stressed plants, the heat from last summer, got the leaves to burn off, just it looks, it looks rough. Here we need to grow more roots, and I'll tell them to put this on in addition to probably the all-purpose plant food, put them down at the same time. This will encourage more root growth, get rid of that stress, and then you'll get better uptake with the fertilizer. you get a better looking plant next spring. Yeah. What did you think that's be good for? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It could be good. Um, yeah, for lawns. I mean, anytime your seedlings, uh, wildflowers. This is if you want more roots. What about a tree, though? Tree, tree could be okay. Yeah, it's it's one extra step. I think the all-purpose food is the most important for a new planting because they need the nitrogen too. So yes. Sure. For, for pine trees, your natives especially, uh, putting together the uh, 10, we got a garden column going on right now, is the 10 things you need to do for fall. This is kind of one of the things. Uh, for, for native trees, use the all-purpose plant food, and then I don't think you need anything else, just this. Uh, if, it, if you got some issues like pine scale, Ips beetle, bark beetle, you see any kind of damage to the evergreens in your neighborhood, I would say also give them a dose of plant protector. I didn't bring that up to talk about that, but there's a systemic bug control that takes care of evergreens and put it together for, for our evergreens because um, we've got such a problem with that. So especially the ones that are really, really valuable. Some of you bought your properties. You built your house around some of these trees. I mean, if you lose them, there's no, there's no recovery. You really want to take care of those those trees. I would plant protect those little liquid that you pour around the base and then fertilize them. Natives, you can go overboard with natives. Once one feed in a year, usually in the fall, great. It's probably all you need to do. Uh, and then watch your watering, that kind of stuff, making sure we take um, they've been there for hundreds of years, but 
that was before you built your house. Roads went in, we changed the contour of the, the property, and now it's not getting the water it did get, or it's getting too much. We've just changed its environment, much less the heat island effect where all those rooftops raise the temperature five, eight, eight degrees in your neighborhood that it's not used to. So that's where you might want to take once a month water things. For me, I just watered a couple weeks ago because it was pretty hot. Back, remember it was like 100 degrees, it was pretty warm. My gardens were looking kind of, you could tell they looked hot. So I just took a fan sprinkler hose on the end of the hose and just ran it out there for an hour or so. Then just took the edge off. Now the drip irrigation is more efficient. Keeps you, I kept the drip on, but I just added to it. That really makes your natives really happy. Okay, great questions, yeah. But can we see what you want to use instead of root and grow and then new plants that you want to Ha! We're getting really, I can tell we've got a whole bunch of gardeners in the room. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, so root and grow, which is this stuff here. This is a composted tea. Uh, it looks like a dark syrup. It looks like molasses. Look, 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 look. You add it to water. I made this specifically for transplant shock, for new planting. Also makes an awesome uh, cactus or houseplant fertilizer. This is like magic. Uh, but really, it's it's probably too expensive to use on the scale you need for a tree like that. There, you're better off putting the humic down for something that's stressed. You need that. Oh, transplanted. Yeah, this is the stuff. Yeah, this is better. So I'll give this. I just did a whole bunch of gardening in my backyard. Again, I got a whole new remodel. I re redid all the steps. Patio trips, walls, dry washes, man, that's a lot. Uh, but it's a 20-year-old house, and, you know, things just get, they fall down, they rot, things, they need to refresh and things. So that's what we did. And so, put a whole lot of plants in last week, just getting, making it finishing touch, kind of the, the frosting. And so everything got this when I first put it in, and then I followed up a couple weeks later, so I just did this again a couple days ago, and then that's, it looks like they're stable, so they're starting to grow, which is kind of what you want. So that's all up. Then you don't ever need this again, probably ever. That's when your fertilizers take off. That's when it's really doing that kind of work. So I didn't really mean to go over how to plant and that kind of stuff. Just some things to look at for your garden is fertilize, uh, just what kinds of fertilizers. Because fertilizers, they're confusing. At one time, I sold over 11 fertilizers through the garden center. I had a rose food, two lawn foods, and an evergreen food, and a fruit tree food. It was crazy. Here's the inside, the dirty secret. Food is food. Plants don't care. That's all labeling, product, and marketing to get you to buy more. That's all it was. So I got rid of it. We were going organic anyway. It's all those synthetics. I'm going, okay, all this stuff is out of here. We're making our own. We're going to make it where one food will do it. You don't have to think anymore. And it's slow release enough where it's good for everything in a in a mountain landscape, and that's when we came up with all those plants. That was like 15 years ago, so that, that's kind of the dirty little secret of, of plant foods. That's why it's so mysterious, confusing. It doesn't have to be. Okay, so fall, fall is for planting, and here's why: it's the best time to plant, especially larger things. Or if you're going to need a privacy screen or, or a big tree or evergreens or big big uh, shade tree or, or fall color, now is a great time to plant. What's happening is the plants, as they transition to color, they start bringing all those sugars and carbohydrates back into their roots. And there's this huge root flush in the fall of the year. Now to the end of the year, plants are actually actively, they're hibernating. They're taking on fat, basically like a bear or a squirrel or something that's hibernating. They do the same thing when they do it underground. So they're, they're transitioning all those sugars back into the root structure. <clears throat> if you know you're going to get a big root flush, now through about Christmas or so, um, shoot, take advantage of that. Especially if you want things like fruit trees. You want pretty color like lilacs in the spring. Now's the time to plant them so they got some roots on them. And then next spring, you'll get more roots, and you'll get you'll actually have a, flood, a nicer, bigger, showier plant. If you need a hedgerow or something to block off your neighbor's you know, class A RV, they park right in your back <laughs> patio. Um, 
Now's the time to plant that. So you can, it won't grow a lot right now, but it will root a lot. And then next spring, you will flush a lot of growth. And so it's a really good time. With that being said, if you're planting now, actually, no matter what, you need to water in the winter. So especially you folks that have landscapers, landscapers, be careful of that. Maintenance, mow and blow folks, they couldn't get a job anywhere else. I should not let this on film, because I get some good, good landscapers that, that, that shop here, but they're not very smart. They don't know, but they bluff their way like they know. And so they'll tell you, they'll shut down your irrigation in November going, you don't need to water again until next May or April, whenever we power it back up, whatever the crew's coming around the neighborhood, powering up irrigation, get your backflow going, you need to water year-round here. You cannot, a plant cannot go from November through April without any water. That is not possible. So, and we're notorious for not having any moisture in the winter. So if we do, we'll get a skip of snow, which is like nothing. It's like no water. And so you need a major snow event to really get any kind of moisture into those plants. And so you should be watering plants, especially things you plant in the fall of the year, uh, any kind of new plants, at least two times a month. That's all you need. Just take the edge off. Pick a nice day. Pick the hose up. Just water it in. That will make sure those plants continue rooting and you don't get what we call winter kill. That's when a plant gets real dry, then a cold event comes, and you go down from, you went from 40 degrees down to all of a sudden it's, you know, 18 degrees. That's hard on plants. But a hydrated plant takes that on like it was nothing. But a dry plant gets damaged. The tips will burn, so we'll have called tip burn or winter burn. And so this is really important for evergreens. Um, it's just really important, just something to watch. It's a rookie mistake you'll find in your neighborhood. You'll walk your neighborhood, you'll see next spring damage. Uh, and it's going to be that just what I just said. It's going to be winter burn or sort of tip burn because that plant was dry when it got real cold. For my container garden, so right now, I'm taking... Okay, so, don't let me forget, container gardens. I'm coming right back to that. So I have two things for you today. I created this as planter's spec. Uh, I used to subcontract all my planting out. And so... I, I wanted them to do it exactly the water's way, and so I put this together for them. You could hand this to your landscaper, go put it in like this. Boom. Tells them how many emitters to put on what size, what size hole, how much you need. It's really for landscape stuff. It'd be helpful for you too. I've got a more detailed one for do-it-yourself backyard at home. But for contractors, because they're so time sensitive, they just want to get it in, get it out, move on. Um, this made sure they did it at the right way, and it's got irrigation uh, hung in for you. How many meters does a seven gallon need? How many meters does a 15 gallon need? It'll help you with that if you've got a drip system. And then fertilizing. What I just took five minutes for, here's a whole sheet of how to fertilize. For the year, it does mention the fall too, but this is for the year. This is what I put together, just and it mentions all these, these three things. It mentions that. So I'll email that to you in a PDF. You get both of those. Um, if you give me your email. So if you want that, and if you're part of our garden club already, it's not going to everyone, it's only going to, to you all. So 15 that are here, whatever her is here. Okay. So back to containers. So my containers, I've got over 50 containers. I have a lot of container gardens. We have a lot of patios. So our front yard, we probably have a over a thousand feet, just a beautiful patios, running water, fountains, features, color. It's private, so we screened out the neighbors in the front. Just it feels like you want to have a cup of coffee in the morning, watch the birds. That's it. Lots of containers on that. So we accessorize the patios because it felt kind of sterile. Without that, she needs something to kind of accent. There's some art out there and that kind of stuff. You get a pretty pot. It is art. The pot itself is art, and then you put plants in it. It's just like magic. The back patios are really big, so it's the entire length of the house uh, with fire pits and barbecues. It's just it's big. Again, it's I didn't want to put a railing. It's also got a negative edge, so we're overlooking the dells. I didn't want to put a railing up, which I should legally, but sometimes you can do it yourself. You don't have to go by code. You're going by what you want. 
And so there I use pots at the edge. It's like a six foot drop off. Mainly to keep the grandkids from throwing themselves off the edge of the patio. So uh, I just use pots there. So it's probably a dozen pots. And just different things out there. So that's how we're using containers. And I want the containers to look good 12 months out of the year. You, can, you cannot look bad in the ever if you look good. So lots of evergreens, lots of perennials as, as anchors, but I'm also accessorizing with annuals, annuals that are put in by season. So right now I'm looking to pull out the, the tomato that's just tired. Now some, of your, some of your tomatoes have all green, green tomatoes, and you just hope when you get them picked, and some have been producing like crazy, and they just haven't, they haven't set a, a flower or a bud or a tomato in a month. Those I'm looking to actively pull out. So I'm looking for the tired petunia. I've got some petunias that are rock stars. Oh my gosh, I can't believe how beautiful. All of a sudden they look tired. I'm looking to get rid of those. I'm looking, if you, if you even blink and you look ugly in my garden, you are out. It's dangerous. You better look like a, you better be beautiful all the time. And so right now I'm looking to put pansies in. Kale, snapdragons. There's a whole series of color you can put in now. It's, it's not a huge selection. Spring, you've got a, you have 500 varieties. The whole greenhouse is filled with nothing but color. Now you've got a dozen varieties of colors. But they're all the ones that you can plant now that will go, probably will bloom right through winter. The reason I'm trying to put pansies and snaps in right now is that I want them to have time to fill out and get full and chubby. If I were to wait until the frost takes the geraniums in October or first of November, I could plant pansies then and they'll grow some, but they're not going to be, they'll be quadrupled in size, but get them in now and get a month and a half worth of growth before frost comes. I can take this one gallon thing and make it look like this just by, by plugging it now. So I'm looking, I'm actively looking to replace some of my summer plants, even though they look great. I know it's coming in four weeks, five weeks, six weeks at most. Frost is going to take those out, and then I've got a dead thing sitting there. And then it's harder to, rec to recover from that. So I'm looking, not to replace the entire container, but something that's, that's not quite looking good, rip that out, put the new one in, just so I've got time to fill it out. That way, my containers look great right through winter. One last tidbit with container gardens. Going back to that water when it's cold. If I hear the weatherman saying it's going to be a cold one, oh my gosh, it's coming down from the north, it's going to be, we're going to get so much snow, and people head to the grocery store and take everything off the shelf. So, you know the event, you've been here. Uh, make sure you're watering those plants before it's cold. It seems counterintuitive, but moist plants go through cold better than dry plants. And so they hydrate. What happens is plants have, have antifreeze in them. And as long as they're moist, they can keep that antifreeze going back and forth. As soon as they get dry, they can't move the antifreeze and they, they start to, to die out, which damage is caused. Question? Snapdragons that are still looking really good from the spring. Yeah. You pull those out. Green thing. No, those are keep going. Snapdragons look good for two to three years. I call them a biennial. Yeah. They look good for a couple of years, and then finally, about second to third year in, you just can't fertilize them enough. You, can't, you either cut them back to the ground, or you just you know for seven ninety nine you put a whole brand new one in. Looks great for the next two years. So that's kind of what I do. Or there's a new color. Something I'll, I'll just see, again, I own a garden center, so I open those trucks up and it's like Christmas. Every time a delivery comes, as a gardener, you just get giddy with the whole thing. And, oh, never seen that. I, got, I want to go try that. And so I'm looking at the place things. It's kind of just fun. It helps me. Uh, I would keep them. What I would do right now is my snapdragons that have dead stalks, or real tall stalks, I'm looking to cut those off to where the green is and I fertilize them so they'll flush new growth and they'll keep that color through Thanksgiving or, or even longer. It's amazing. Snapdragons are great. Animals don't eat them. Um, again, I didn't come up with a colored fall thing. Just think, here's some things I'm doing. My name's Ken. We're just friends. We're like neighbors talking over the back fence. Here's some things I'm doing. I think it would help your gardens too. 
Uh, I think it'll make a difference for the long haul. Yeah. Do animals eat pansies? They do eat pansies. They're delicious. <laughs> they look good on salads too. So, yeah, don't don't put them out where the animals can get to them. Yeah, that's why you have blow guns, dart guns, and electric fence, <laughs> so, or something. Mainly in my backyard, I've got cedar fence. Keep the dogs in for for, for us. We're dog people. In the front yard. We're not allowed to have fencing in our, our HOA. So at night I snuck out and I put an electric fence about one foot off the ground around, not the whole yard, because I don't want people tripping up and being stunned while they get in the front door, but just enough to keep the javelina from, that's my nemesis, javelina, from coming up and eating that my pansies, basically. So that, that, that definitely, definitely works very well. So, okay, let's go down to plants. What you can plant now. I'm going to borrow, if I may, here I'll use this shopping cart. This would be perfect. That way we can capture this on the film, too. So let's just start here. This is a plant that looks good this time of the year. This is the rock star. Um, all the grass is really look great this time of year. Oh, great. This is called muley grass, or an ambergia. Muley grass is kind of what the locals call it. It's a native. Animals don't eat it. It just looks great. And when the sun shines through it, it's like magic. It's like beautiful, the way that it just moves in the wind. Grass is, we're in natural grass country. Uh, all those valley areas, just there's a lot of different kinds of grasses that we grow and they all seem to do well. This is perennial, we'll come back every year. The reason we don't, we sell most of these in the fall instead of in the spring. In the spring, they're perennial. We cut them back down to the ground about right here. And so they're starting to emerge, but no one's gonna buy a green, you know, basically a bucket of dirt with some green stuff coming out of it. But when we do this to it, they go, oh, I get it, this looks great. So I grow this in containers right out in the yard. Uh, we have a lean are, it just doesn't matter. It's a great little plant. There's a lot of grasses you can play with. Of course, the most famous of all the grasses is pampas grass. Pampas is, uh, it's got the big white plumes on it right now. It stands about, I don't know, six, eight feet tall. For the dwarf, that's the dwarf one. The standard size is like 10, 12 feet. I mean, it's a monster. In fact, we don't even sell that one here. It's just so big, most yards just can't accommodate 12 foot grass. So the six foot, you'll see on the parking lot, those are ivory feather campus grass. That's the dwarf variety. It's a shorter grass, but it still has that same big plume. I don't introduce that one into my yard just because well, I don't want to work that hard. It's just you got to put it back. It's so big. I could have three plants instead of just one and have more fun because I'm a gardener. I like, I like plants. And so I just don't do that. I do coral foresters, muley grasses, bunny grass, a lot of different kinds of grasses I've got to do with. But that's the big one. That's what everyone comes to ask for, and I sell the most of. But to my friends, I would encourage you to look at other varieties too, because they're way less maintenance and problematic. Not problematic. What's the name of that? Plant? This is muley grass. Think mule deer. That. I think I heard you say that you keep those grasses in a pot. Yeah. Because they're invasive. No, not because they're invasive. Just because they're pretty. This with a beautiful mocha pot. Look at that. The colors just go together. Uh, an aqua color. Uh, just, you can create art, design, with a pretty thing like this. And it grows for years. So I plant it once. This will fill up with even a big pot. I'm done for five years until I get tired of it, basically. Yeah. Roses, I do that. This is another one. I, did, I just planted a whole bunch of these in my new uh, landscape. So I went up to step to this. see interfering with the maybe I'll play with frequencies before next week's class. That would okay. Anyway, we're back. Ah, ah. Oh, baby. Talk to Papa. Sometimes you know what's actually more frustrating? Technology. 
you just, you're never, you're never up to date. There's always another patch. There's always an update. Always a, you're not quite right. The UV, USB doesn't quite fit. Just come, come on. You've got to be kidding me. Plus, I dropped my phone in the lake. That does not help your phone. Let's go. Right. Testing, one, two, three. I'm walking on eggshells now. Or not. I'll just turn it off and get to bed. I'm going. My mama taught me how to talk loud, so, <laughs> so southern roots. Okay, so uh, this grass I used next to the steps just because it's really pretty. But the reason I used it uh, is where, where guests kind of come and go from the from the driveway down to the back patio. I want something bright, I wanted something light. So if they have to leave when it's dusk or darker, this will actually brighten. I mean, I've got lighting there too. It looks like a resort, but I'm picking, I wanted this to pick up the lighting from the landscape lights so it's real bright. Or a full moon, this just shines. Uh, they make this, it's called uh, zebra grass. There's two varieties. This one's called Japanese silver grass and there's zebra grass. It's the exact same thing like the the lines go this way instead of this way. It's just fun. So I've got several of these out in the yard. I've got quite a few of this particular one. It only gets about this big. You're really planting it for the foliage. It does get a flower on it, a plume. It's rather insignificant. You're really planting it for that, the foliage. So it's just pretty. Grass, this is the time to plant grass. So if you're wanting evergreens, you're just about to have your evergreens are going to carry you. 20% of your landscape, at least 20, should be dedicated to evergreen plants. Otherwise, in a month and a half, by Thanksgiving, you'll be going, dang, Ken was right. My, my yard does look naked. There's nothing out there. It's a little landscape because everything went dormant. Well, this is one that's, that's completely evergreen. This is Cotone Aster. You spell it like Cotton Easter. So people that don't know Latin. But Cotone Aster, this is how it looks year round. It gets a white flower in the spring of the year that turns into a red berry. This is Coral Beauty. This is, uh, gets up maybe about that tall and kind of spreads like this. So we use it as ground covers. I will design into a rock lawn at the edge, kind of soften up that edge to make it look like something's living in that part of the garden. Great for erosion control, hillsides, kind of in the hillside irrigation up here, just watch it grow. This thing will turn into this all by itself. So Katoni asked her. He would take it. <laughs> Post on Facebook with it. Hashtag Waters Garden. <laughs> Actually we plant these together quite often. These are very often companion plants in the same landscape, same drip system. We'll take the junipers. This is a this is a ground carpet uh, type of juniper. Uh, this blue rug juniper, but then you can get too much of this color. You can get too much of that height. You get too much. So you put 10 to 12 feet of this stuff around, you go, oh, that's pretty. It was pretty back when it was planted. Now it's just overgrowing. You put it with this, all of a sudden you get a contrast. The greens and the blues, different heights, different textures. It just looks good. This blooms, this doesn't. It's just good. Animals don't eat either one of these. So rabbits seem to be a problem right now. Skunks are out, so you're seeing a lot of different things like that. They don't bother either one of those. Mm -hmm. well, uh, let's just pick companion plants out on that theme. These are two companion plants. Um, this is Calgary Carpet. They're both called carpet. This is a blue rug because it looks like a, this is tall as it gets. What is that? Two inches? This one gets a little bit taller. That's about as tall as it gets. And then it flows out like this. Uh, big, this will turn into a six by six, maybe eight by eight kind of plant. So junipers do really, really well here. Doesn't have pollen, so it's not gonna be an allergen thing for you. And animals don't eat it. It's got a pretty green that contrasts against some other textures. And this is the time of year when you want, these are your evergreen stuff. This is Raphaelyptus or Indian Hawthorn. Uh, 
evergreen, broadleaf evergreen shrub. And I'll keep these up here so you can kind of look at tags and stuff. Uh, this is called Southern Moon. It's got a real bright white flower in spring. It's very fragrant, but this is what it looks like through the winter. Just a great little mounding kind of button. I've used this in my uh, front yard containers. This is just this low maintenance, perfectly balanced, pretty evergreen. It blooms in the spring. The blooms are almost a bonus. What's the name of that? This is uh, Indian Hawthorne. Can you come up and snap a picture of the label? That's, that's the easiest way to, to track that. This is one I have a lot of. <laughs> this is one. These, I brought these three mainly as companion plants, and then uh, they're just tough. They're more that southwesterny kind of <coughs> flavor. So we have that Santa Fe house. And that's what this is. Uh, I do not have a Santa Fe house, but I still like these. And I've got them. Um, this is a yucca. Lots of yuccas do well here. Um, this is specifically Bright Star Spanish Dagger. What is it? it looks a uh, Bright Star Spanish Dagger. It's just got that variegated gold to it, which is very unusual. Usually your yucca kind of plants have the blues. Maybe some greens like the banana yucca. Usually they're a blue color, Arizona color. Arizona blue is kind of the color. This is a great contrast with those. So this would be more like an Arizona color. It's green, but it's not really green. It's more blue. It's got blue green. Well, those just go together really, really well. Manzanita, uh, silverberry, Tony Ash. This just looks really good. And this is what it looks like year out. That's it. How big does it get? Super drought hardy. Big ones, maybe hip high or so, something like that. Kind of, kind of this big, like an agave, like an artichoke agave, kind of that size. It can get a white flower on it. It's pretty, but really you're planting it for this. This is what it, this, this would go great in a container, uh, on, a, on a patio or something. So it's really good. Get that classic. This is the style. This in a pot. That's what you're seeing on design magazines. That's that's one that works really well. Super drought hardy. This has got a similar color. This is one of the only, one of the few, not only, few perennials, we'll come back over here, that's evergreen. So I use this a lot in containers. Euphorbia, <coughs> uh, rainbow ascot euphorbia. Um, it's related to poinsettias of all things. You poinsettias are a euphorbia family. So when you break a stem off, you get this that white milky uh, sap to it, which means animals don't like, to, they don't like the taste. That sap it puts on uh, is as a defense to keep squirrels, rabbits, deer. I've got some of these that are ancient, probably this big around. They put on a funky Dr. Seuss kind of flower to it. It's really kind of weird. It's the same color as this, but different texture. It floats above the foliage. It's kind of, kind of neat looking. When you look at it, you go, what is going on? Oh, look at that. It's blooming. It's that kind of a response. Uh, but that's really what you're planting for. This is its winter color. Um, so, and again, this, I planted this in my new landscape up the pathways because I'm looking for bright colors and I needed some evergreen stuff. So this one looked great. Containers in the ground, wherever. Euphorbia, rainbow ascot. And of course, rosemary. Every yard needs at least one. <laughs> so this is actually in bloom. It's not unusual. Rosemaries are so happy here. They'll usually start blooming in March sometime, kind of the first of spring. It's, it's, it's the first day of spring, it's in bloom. It's one of the first ones to bloom. It's a pollinator for bees. They're very hungry when spring first hits, so they're foraging. They're very much attracted to this. Then you can use it in the kitchen. It's just pretty evergreen. It goes in containers, goes in the yard, goes wherever you want. It comes in upright variety and a spreading variety or carpet variety. All right, colored stuff. Let's go for flowers. Get rid of that one. These are two of our most famous, probably. Russian sage. It's a weed. It's from <laughs> Afghanistan, of all things. Uh, Provinskia, something or other. Some German, Russian German general who's a botanist was taking over Afghanistan. He's doing his plant thing. Oh, that's neat. Taking that back home. He introduced it to the world. 
but in the mountains of Afghanistan, it's very much like here, and it just thinks it's right at home. So much so that uh, you've got to kind of maintain it some, so otherwise it will take over. It recedes pretty easily. So sometimes it'll take a runner, and I want to run up over here. Don't let it do that. So I'll go out a couple times a year and go, oh, no, 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 no. You're not allowed to grow there. I'm going to pull it up. Uh, but my front landscape, the brother for the uh, uh, street, it's just got several of these. Just because they're, they're, they're base shaped, they're bloom from summer through fall. They're perennial, come back every year. I don't water them. It's just a great little plant for it's a It's a pollinator, so I'm trying to attract more hummingbirds and butterflies from my front landscape so I can enjoy them. For them too, but mainly for me. Uh, and I plant in front of that this guy. This is uh, Salvia gregii, or autumn sage. These are companion plants to each other. Uh, they're both deciduous, that is, they'll lose their leaves. Um, another tip I could share with you, just this is School of Hard Knocks. Um, do not prune this one back too early in spring. This is usually the last one I'll prune. I'll usually prune this back in March. And here's the only reason. One year, we got I got caught where I put it back early, like in January. I had the shears out, and I couldn't stop. And I just pruned it back, got it back, sheep perfectly. And then we went sub-zero. And it killed off, it killed one. So now I just tell folks, keep the foliage up through winter. And once you know that harsh cold's done, then put it back. Just get us out. We may still can have snow and cold, but it just went sub-zero, and it killed the root, and it didn't come back to me. So just, I want you to be more successful too. Here's something I've learned, and it's made a difference. Um, this one doesn't matter, you can't kill it. In fact, if anything, Russian sage needs to be pulled out. This only looks good for about five, maybe six years. And then it just looks overgrown, mangy. It just looks, this big matted thing that doesn't, looks, it looks overgrown, jungle-like, not designer, garden-esque-like. So about every five or six years, I'll pop mine out. The shovel pops it right out like it was nothing. They come out really easy, and I'll plant a new one. Uh, sometimes you keep these on too long, especially if you start to reseed all over the yard. That's an indication of starting to chuck, starting to choke itself out. So it's throwing seed off to try to reproduce over there before it dies. It's a defense thing that it's doing naturally. Uh, the botany of the plant. These two are companion plants. They just look good together. The green, the blue, the texture, the color, the flowers. This comes in a bunch of colors. Pinks and whites, apricots, purples. We're trying to introduce more because it does so well here. This comes in blue or purple, whatever that color is. That's the only color. That's it, yeah. Now you cut that back in the winter, don't you? The I, I do mine. I'll cut it back to about knee high. Some people will say cut it back with a lawnmower, really tight. I like to control it more, so I like, I like, there's a form I like to see. I want it to be base shaped, perfect. I want neighbors to go by going, oh, I just love that plant. I just, that's so pretty. I want it to look like that. And so when I cut it back to the ground, it's, I have less control over it. I'll, I'll thin it back to maybe 10 or 12 key branches, stems coming up, back to about knee high or so, and then everything else goes. And the main thing is the suckers, those runners, don't let the runners go. Yes. Um, about two years ago. And they just want to grow tall and then they get lanky yeah. all over. Now, was this in Ohio or here? Now you're here. Ohio. Ohio, it's too wet there. It's just too moist, too humid, too. Everybody else has success. I didn't like that. They'll prefer being grown, grown here. They stay with bad soil. They love bad soil. They like to be, you know, cursed at. They like to be just beat up, neglected. That's what they thrive on. Uh, another secret too, you said they flop over, they get too wet, they'll flop. Um, I only water mine for one year, then I cut it off with all the water. So that I don't get, they stand more upright. So when they get real wet, or, or a rainy season, a monsoon, if you get a rough, wet, wet monsoon, they almost get drunk with water. They just lay over and go, ah, duh, I can't, can't take it anymore. And so keep them drier, we'll keep them more upright, and that's kind of, Neglect more, so 
Gardeners, this could be hard because you're loving on them too much. <laughs> Just kind of kick some dirt at them every once in a while and walk away. That's probably what you do. Another one we're famous for, uh, butterfly bush. Again, we're trying to introduce more and more butterfly bush varieties and colors. Uh, the standard was Dark Knight. That's when your grandparents grew. It's a ginormous butterfly bush. It's 10, 12 feet tall. I mean, small children, dogs have been lost in butterfly <laughs> bush. I mean, they just get so big. We're introducing more and more dwarf varieties, ground cover varieties even. So hip high. A butterfly bush, it puts the same flower on, but it only grows this tall. Perfect. That's what looks good in container, next to patios, without all the work. And that's what this variety is. This is called, lo and behold, this only gets up about that tall and spreads like this. It has the same flower that its adult parent had, its cousin, Dark Knight had. And then we introduce more, it's a lighter purple, not that dark, rich purple or pinky purple, whatever color that is. God only gave, man, you understand. We only have seven crayons, right? We don't have that 64 <laughs> box that like the owls do. So whatever color that is. Butterfly bush, just really well. Really, this is this is deciduous. If we get a mild winter, it can be it can keep some of its foliage, but really, I just I'll keep this. Is another one where this will be the last thing I prune around March. I'll start to clean this thing up. But if you've got a bigger variety, it's be really aggressive. I mean, if it's ten feet tall, ignore the book. Just trim it back. So you can keep it under control because they're really happy growing here. And butterflies, they really do like them. They're all over these. Monarchs, swallowtails, painted ladies, all of them. Um, we're actually in good rose country. Uh, this is a new, we're trying to introduce more and more. You know, we sell thousands of roses. We're kind of famous for our roses. Huh. Uh, I don't even know what we're going to do next year. We can't get enough of them. Just like the, the market's running out, so we're trying to we're trying to collect them now. Um, we're trying to introduce more shrub varieties of roses. Your grandparents always grew hybrid teas and floribundas. Those are the two big things. Hybrid teas, the long stem rose, long stem with one flower coming out. Floribundas are long stem rose with a cluster of flowers on the end. Those are the two main ones. You have to have fancy graphs, you count back three nodes, kind of 45 degree angle for like more often. They're complicated. They're gardeners, I'm talking to gardeners, uh, but still they take more work. Shrub roses take no work. There's no graft, so if it dies back to the ground, it comes back just like the planted it is, um, and it self prunes. So put on a little bit smaller flower, but then when it's done blooming, it self prunes and then sets another flower all by itself. For landscape shrubs, that is like magic. That's the way to go. Now you have to go out and touch it every 45 days to get to bloom again. So I'm shifting a lot of my things over to carpet roses, shrub roses, easy elegant roses. They have a lot of names, uh, but really it's a shrub rose. And so it'll get the standard size, about this big. But the main thing is it, it blooms it has more flowers, but each flower is a little bit smaller, and then it self prunes. Autopilot, that's good. Yeah, autopilot's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so here, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a confusing question. You get a lot of different things. So Phoenix are cutting theirs back in November. You don't do that here. Here we'll get through March again. What we're trying to do is keep the foliage up over the mass, over the root structure, so it will insulate or protect the root zone. So we can have some serious cold events where we get a frost line. Super unusual, but it's possible. And so uh, what we're trying to do is keep this foliage up through the harshes of winter, and then in March, we prune back roses. March. Very counterintuitive. It's Midwest, they all prune them back before no January, fall. Right? Yeah, California, no. it's January. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Religious Here, what, if you do it in January, it could work. But if we go cold, we're still in the cold part of our, of our winter, really till about Valentine's Day, it's, it's brutal cold. And sometime about mid-February breaks, and we're still getting frost, we're still getting that bitter, burnt, you know, chilling, bone chilling kind of cold, that's over with. And the nice days are back with us. Then you can start moving. Now, yeah. 
a lot of these plants, I know the roses are going to need a lot of sun, but like all of these other plants, we have a lot of trees on our property, a lot nice. of fine trees, big trees. Yeah. How much do I have to be worried about how much sun they're getting on? So everything I've showed you so far, except for the grasses, grasses need probably at least four hours of sun. Oh, they do. Uh, the rest of them need six hours or more, which is considered full sun here. Okay. Because the altitude, uh, the sun is more intense. Even the reflective, even underneath the trees, it's filtered. That's still quite a bit of sun coming through. Uh -huh. You'll be stunned at what you can grow, even in the more shaded areas, because of the altitude. So, uh, but I would say most of your blooming things are going to need more sun, at least six hours plus. Uh, if you need more shaded things, that's one watch it, and this is during the growing season. You can already tell the days are getting shorter. So it'll get really short by the end of the year. Um, that doesn't count. What counts is the growing season, April, May, June. The plants are actively growing, putting foliage. How many hours do you get? And then we can hone you in on, you have the, the ability to put more azaleas, rhododendrons, hollies, things that people really want. They can't because there's too much sun in most yards. They'll burn up. You could have uh, Japanese maples. Everyone wants one. Very few can actually grow them because they, they don't take the full sun. Well, in that filtered, filtered uh, canopy underneath trees, it's like the perfect growing environment. Okay, but in the grasses, do they should they wood. should be fine. Yeah, they should be fine. Yeah, this one will do fine too. This is sumac. This is what's going all going in color right now. You're seeing this color all over the hillsides. That's what this is. This is sumac. Um, this is aromatic or, or grow low sumac or fragrant sumac when you rub the foliage it smells good it's good it's a flower in spring it's very fragrant the main thing about sumacs is you plant up you water them and care for them for one year and then you never have to think about them again let them go they are native so take them off the drip system they won't like that you're going to kill it it'll be from over watering so it's a true native and so, but what it's most famous for is its fall color. It announces autumn. So by next week, you'll see oranges all over the mountainsides. That's the sky going up, that, you know, going into color. And it's a very great a ground cover. It gets this tall, but then spreads out. This will get out to six, eight feet wide again. Natives. Three of the most common. I put my kids through college with these four plants. <laughs> uh, they're all evergreen. And we're, we're loading up right now. What's happening in garden centers, we know cold is coming. So we're, we're harvesting plants right now. We're, we're bringing in the winter inventory because once it gets really cold, it's not even a year, I can't really <laughs> ship plants off. It's hard, it's hard to harden them off or acclimate them. So we need to predict how many plants we're going to have through winter so we will have enough that are used to our cold. So we're starting to load up with a lot of these kind of plants because they're the winter rock stars. They just look good. This one is, is called Golden Euonymus because it's gold. This is called Silver Euonymus. They're the same plant. You want a blonde or brunette? That's kind of the difference. It's the same size plant. Same. The only difference is the color of the foliage. That's it. So evergreen, get off today. Come on. So they get up about head high, full. We, we do hedges with this. From the east coast, it's kind of a, a core plant user, but these actually adapt really well here. It's got a real waxy <coughs> leaf to it. So the wax and the leaf actually makes them very draw hardy. They take their dryness really, really well. You can keep them small. You can keep them down to maybe about four foot. In a container, no more than four, but otherwise it's too much work. They naturally want to go to six feet. Uh, there is no work, hardly any work. Lower than that, you can do it if you trim it on them enough, but there's probably better varieties we can shift you over to that stay low maintenance so you're not cutting them in so much. You said for a hedge, how wide, how narrow Great. So the math, if you just ask me only mathematically, tell you how many plants you need. I got a 20 foot run. This thing says it gets six feet wide. You're going to do a hedge. It is an overlapping hedge up to cover high. You take the width of the plant, divide it by two. That's your spacing. 
Yeah. 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 The width of the hedge. What's this? The thickness of the hedge. <coughs> so this would be about three to four foot centers down that line. This particular oh, plant. Oh, that's a smaller plant might be tighter. A boxwood. This is a you know, small plant. There I might plant these every 18 inches. Just to, if you want to hedge this low, this I'm low hedge. About, not the spacing, but trimming it into a hedge. Oh. you got how how. Oh, almost. Right. You can do whatever you want. Have fun with it. Create an animal, a sculpture. Okay. Like, so what would be the minimum? For this particular plant, minimum, I would say, would be about two feet. Depends on the plant. So this one, you could probably go tighter. But these are bigger plants. This one, you probably only go down to six feet. This is red tip potinia. That new, all the new growth is red. This is a monster. This thing gets up. 12 feet tall by 12 feet wide, it wants to be, it wants to take over the landscape. So I don't have any of these in my yard. My, my yard, I got a half an acre. But I don't want something this big in my yard just overgrow, fill up the space. I want more plants, more texture differences. So this one would be a, a would have a, needs to be whiter or it'll look woody. It's it's it. This is red tip potinia and euonymus. Yeah. So the yellow one, a year and a half ago, I planted, and they're only getting smaller. What could be problem? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's happened a few times to me over the years. Or you plant it, it doesn't grow, it just sits there. Five years later, it's the same size. <laughs> yeah. You wanted to get this big. What's the problem? Yeah. It's almost always a soil issue. Something in the soil. A couple things to check. One, think, who had grubs over here? Someone had grubs. So I've had grub issues. There's a white worm that eats the roots off of plants. That's their main diet. Check for that, because it's been pronounced this year has been a bad grub year. See if you got something like grow gophers, something weird going on, cutworms. Just take a test hole, see what's in the field. If you see anything, it's never just that one, you've, you've got many. Or, more likely, because that's a seasonal event, more likely it's gonna be, you've got a rock shelf, a caliche layer, Something's going on that's affecting the drainage underneath that plant, and it's affecting the plant's not happy. And so it's trying to react, it's trying to, to respond to that and grow to the right size. More than likely a drainage issue, but test it to see. Well, using your stuff. Yeah, well, that doesn't make the, you dig a hole and you fill up with stuff, you still get a bathtub effect. So you might have to take a chimney or Call, we'll, we'll dig a hole, we'll take the jackhammer, we'll come and plant it for you. We'll take the jackhammer, we'll dig the hole the right size, and we'll the jammer just try to fracture up the layer underneath that. So we can crack that, you know, soil's coming in bands, I'm getting way too technical. Uh, but we'll try to fracture so that soil, the water will start flowing and perky. Seems to drain well. Good. Something's up. It's, it's, not, it's not happy, so. Uh, but I tell you what, I know you can buy a new one if you want to try again. <laughs> there are six too. of them. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see a lot of these around. There's, there's quite a few in your neighborhood. Um, I do find that deer like them, so be careful if you're out in the forest. It's not ideal. You'll probably have a better one called uh, Silverberry. It has a gold color like this. In fact, it's right behind you. Those are Silverberry. It's kind of a similar color. Here, let's, let's pull one of those out if you don't mind me waiting through. I'll just this looks really similar. This is a native. Looks similar to these. This is the one I grow myself. Uh, what I do with this is I'll plant this. I'll put it on the drip irrigation. I treat it with great care. I flush it until it gets up to growth. I'm pushing the growth. Then once it's up to size, I cut it off of all water and all care. It's on its own. We've got quite a few of them that are like this. I've grown this in pots. I grew this in a great big uh, um, uh, cobalt blue pot. The, the blue and gold is a classic design color combo. So the, the, the shiny, coat rich blue with this native looking gold just looked really good. How big did that get? This can get up to head high pretty easy. I've got some as an underplanting in front of my house uh, that I keep down about this high. It's pretty easy to do. Put it back a couple times a year. It's just an evergreen. That's called what? Uh, silverberry. Yeah, silverberry. Will that tolerate being hedged? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I've got I've got three of them in a row. It's about a four by I don't know, ten foot, twelve foot hedge. Looks really good. Yeah. I'll use this often too if I'm designing. Let's see, people come over that utility box in front of their yard. Why they got to show those things off? They don't know you have this million dollar house. Utility box. Uh, I'll use this often to hide that because it's a slower grower, it's native. You can be out there with a deer and have a gnar, they're going to bother it. And it just stays looking like this all the time. I think I'm getting down to it. We're, we're an hour into this. I've got one more. This is too big for most of us. Well, we just got a nice crop of them, man. We're starting to load up now. So what you're seeing right now, as we'll, we'll start loading up through October with the spruce and the pine and the, fruit, the Christmas tree looking things. We'll, we'll have more of those now than we will any other time of the year. Because they look so good, and so many people are using them as living Christmas trees, just holiday stuff. They either plant them and decorate them out there, or they'll bring them inside, decorate them, plant them outside, and the holidays are over in January. This is probably one of the fastest growing of all of the evergreens like that. This is Deodorus cedar. This thing grows three feet, four feet a year. Uh, it gets up, it's a monster. It gets up to 50 feet by 25 feet. Do not get it anywhere close to your house or your driveway, or you'll curse it in about three or four years. You won't be able to put it back in. You're going, Ken, can I, can I transplant this one? No, no, just, here's another one. Here's another one, go plant that. It would be cheaper than trying to transplant this thing. This thing grows to the moon. Perfect scaffolding, big, long, swooping branches. But it's made to be out towards the corners. We we'll plant it in big, big yards on Chino, Williamson Valley. You got space, you want to cut the wind. Privacy screen, you got that house across the ridge line. You want something to got one thing to kind of block it but look natural. Theodore Cedar's the way to go. But it's one of the fastest growing. Arizona Cypress is another one, which is kind of another companion to this. It's smaller, doesn't get as big and aggressive. It's Arizona Cypress typically 20 by 12, They're real thick. So that's not, anyway, evergreens. You're seeing evergreens coming through right now, and it only gets more pronounced. In fact, you're supposed to have a big load this week with two loads. And the fires in California and Oregon, they can't harvest. They can't go to the farm. The farm's not burning. The workers just can't go there because the smoke is so bad right now. It's a health hazard. And so it looks like we'll get twice as many orders next week as this week because we couldn't ship. That's where this COVID pandemic fire, I don't think the world's coming to an end, but sometimes it feels like that. But anyway, uh, the, the fires are affecting even Prescott, Arizona, the plant business of all things. So hopefully that'll come back. It's Northern California and south of Portland is mainly where we're pulling from right now. They're the ones that are growing most of the evergreens. So with that, any last questions? I'll hang out, I'll put my mask on. And if you did you come out and look at the plants, if you want to take pictures of the tags, we can talk one on one. I'd be glad to hang out with you and just kind of be here until you're done. Yeah. Um, I had a question about fruit um, trees. Yeah. Yeah, can you grow peach, apricot, pears, and apples? Yep, yeah. sure when can. When do you plant them? You can plant them now. Thank you. Uh, you can plant them now. Uh, and it'd be a good time. You'll get fruit next next spring. You'll get fruit on them. Oh, okay. So all of our fruit trees are up. They're old enough to fruit. So fruit trees typically have to be anywhere from five to seven years old. Apples are older. Petty fruit a little younger. A minimum of five to seven years before they're old enough to even fruit. So all of our trees are at least that old. Many of them are 10, 12, 15 years old, the bigger ones. So they get so fruit now? They all fruit next spring. Next spring. Some of them have fruit on them in the racks. We try to keep them off. I go through and pick the fruit that it hurts me. But they're either fruiting or they're rooting. If you're planting them in your place, I want them not focused on that fruit. I want to focus on the roots. And so we go through and strategically take the fruit off. That's what they say for the first year to do. Yeah. And that uh, peach tree that you said you're growing at home? Yeah. As well. um, what size of container is that in? And did you plant, is it like a semi dwarf or a dwarf? It's a dwarf probably. Mine is a, is a semi dwarf. You know, I can't remember. I don't think it matters. 
What matters is if you're summer pruning, no matter what size, I don't like dwarfed fruit trees, because dwarf means I only get this big. Well, it's not big enough in my world. I want a tree to be you know, at least my height. And so I typically will plant semi-dwarf plants for things that get big. Cherries get big. Apples get big. Pears get big. Those will go semi-dwarf. Semi-dwarf means it looks like a tree, but it's about 20, 30% smaller than its, than its, than its normal size cousin. Uh, so it still looks like a tree. Uh, that's what I did for the peach. Actually, I think I've got a Red Haven or Ranger, one of those. I forget what variety. I planted it years ago. But what size pot? Yeah. That I've got in the pot about like this. It's, it's a square pot. This by this by this. So I'd go with the bigger pots that you see out here. Yeah. It's all about soil volume. The more volume you have, the longer it can stay in there. Okay. How tall is that tree? 12 feet. Wow. And you put out quite a bit. Uh, bushels. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Big, big, awesome. big uh, peach. Yeah, it does really well. I, yeah, what I'll do is it's, I need to prune it back now, probably before winter. Uh, it's starting to show some fall color now, as it, as it should. I'll print it back probably a couple feet. What I do is I stand up on the bucket, and I, which is about two, three feet tall, and then as far as I can reach, that's how tall the tree can get. And so I print it back to that because I don't want to be on a ladder and you know, break my neck. So I just my brother just broke his heel. It took him a year to recover from that from falling off a stupid ladder or something. So I'm trying to get change my not not doing what my brother did. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I like that. Anything else? Yeah. What What about trimming these huge trees on my property? Um, is there a time and a place? And obviously, I need to hire somebody good yeah. that knows what they're doing. I don't know if you guys. I know it might be a little tough for you to recommend, but would you have a couple people that you could work? I don't prune, so uh, really, I, person I use myself just for my bigger projects. Do. Um, he just took down a huge cottonwood for me, had a crane in, the whole, it was uh, very technical, and it could crush things, it could kill you. He just took down this huge cottonwood, it took probably four or five men to put their arms around, it's huge. Uh, it was Johnny's Tree Service, he's an arborist, he's got actually three or four arborists on staff. Johnny's Schaefer's the owner, he's local, he's been around forever, Okay. and he's gone through a downturn, or several downturns. What you have to be aware of now is, the trades are all, just get on their books. Start calling them now. Wow. Because they're months out. Okay. I've never seen anything from plumbers to roofers to irrigation to tree trimming. They're very busy to spray all things. So just get on their list. Get a bid. There's several guys. There's a lot of new guys showing up now. Arborists. Arborists. I don't know if they're arborists. They say they are. Oh. You just want to check. I've seen some of them are called butchers. <laughs> yeah. They actually do more harm than good. It pains me. Well, that's why I'm asking the Johnny Thank doesn't you. do that. He does, a, he does a, a technically correct, the plant will grow for years in the right form that you want. I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you.